Welcome to Rooting For You, a seasonal gardening podcast for non-experts. I'm Tess and I know nothing. And I'm Elise and I know some things. Each week we'll chat about one gardening topic and then discuss the effort reward payoff by asking, is the juice worth the squeeze? Just a heads up, there might be a bit of swearing in this episode. You've been warned. Welcome to Rooting For You, recording remotely in Melbourne lockdown, so please bear with us for the slightly less than usual recording quality. So a week or so ago, we polled our Instagram followers and the overwhelming response was in favour of an episode on how to grow Jerusalem artichokes. Now, truth be told, I'm not super familiar with the old Jerusalem artichoke. They feel very Middle Eastern to me, but I actually don't really know. So for those of us who aren't familiar with the Jerusalem artichoke, Elise, can you give us a little bit of a sales pitch? What does it taste like? How do we cook it? And how do we eat it? Firstly, I have no idea why it is called a Jerusalem artichoke or if it comes from Jerusalem. So (laughs) So so maybe not not Middle Eastern? (laughs) So maybe, maybe not. Who knows? But I do absolutely love eating them. But before I'm going to give you my sales pitch, and I have prepared one because I knew Tess wasn't sold and I thought I'm going to have to go in hard (laughs) on the sales pitch before I tell you the how – I just want to clarify for people, there are two types of artichokes that we commonly grow for food, the globe artichoke and the Jerusalem artichoke. Now, the the globe one I'm familiar with, that's Mm. the ball with like the leaves that you can pick off and dip in stuff. Bang on. So when people hear artichoke, that's often what they think of. Mm. So those, great. I grow them too. Should anyone be interested, we can do another episode. But that is a completely different related plant to the Jerusalem artichoke we're talking about today. And they don't look similar at all. No. I mean, one, you're harvesting, like the globe artichoke, you're harvesting the flower head. Uh, With the Jerusalem artichoke, you're harvesting the tuber, the same as a potato or garlic, for example. Mm. These are actually a species of sunflower unusually. And again, no relation to the globe artichoke. Whoever did the naming of this, like they need to... You know, it's very misleading. <laughs> they need to provide some explanation because it's a bit confusing, guys. But what I want people to think of with the Jerusalem artichoke, it's just like a potato. Same idea okay. as far as we're growing an edible tuber. We also grow it from an old tuber, same as a potato. So, yeah, look, we'll get into the, the nitty gritty. But let me tell you why I love the particular Jerusalem artichoke. Please. So firstly... They are so delicious. You roast them, you fry them, you make chips out of them, you make soup out of them. I roast them up with heaps of olive oil and my homemade chicken salt, and they are amazing, like a roast potato, but better almost. Mm. I also love making a cauliflower and artichoke soup and then drizzling it with truffle oil. That's a particular favorite. Mm. So culinary-wise, they are pretty exciting. Have you eaten one before, Tess? I don't think so. <laughs> you might have. I really some, don't think so. <laughs> you might have at a fancy restaurant. You didn't even know what it was. Look, very possibly. Possibly. Okay. Well, I've actually eaten all mine for this year, but next year I'll have to make you. <laughs> I'll and talk us through the salad it. that you did recently that you posted about. Yeah, well, that was that was pretty much everything from the garden. And I had just roasted the Jerusalem artichokes with the oil and the chicken salt to they get like really caramelized and gnarly and like crunchy on the outside and soft in the middle. And then I just added some kale from the garden as well that I roasted and some spring onions that I pulled out of the ground mm. and just thinly chopped up. And I tossed all that together. And then I just put some garlic aioli on top and then sprinkled some seeds, like some nuts and seeds that I'd just toasted in some tamari. This, it was actually very easy. I know when I say it out loud, it probably sounds like a few more steps. But, I mean, other than the seeds and the garlic aioli, I had grown the rest. And it was just so flavoursome. Everyone at work had some and we all, like, loved it. And I was like, these are just such a delicious vegetable and no one grows them because they don't even know they exist. But there are more benefits than just the deliciousness. So let me keep telling you why. Just before we move on to the next excellent factor of why we should be, <laughs> why we should be growing through some artichokes, Is it a similar texture to a potato? Yeah, good question. The skin will fry up crunchier than a potato, but the inside almost goes softer than a potato. Yeah, it's a really unusual texture. It goes, I want to say like, it's almost like a roasted pumpkin in the middle and then a really crispy potato skin on the outside. And could you sub it in for whenever you are using potatoes? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Oh, amazing. Okay. And, and what I really like is potatoes we harvest 
from kind of late spring, summer, autumn, we can harvest potatoes, but we don't have potatoes during winter. Jerusalem artichokes are in season to eat during winter. That's our time that we harvest them. So actually, as far as like having that roasted vegetable component, I think it actually fits with our yearly cycle that we have potatoes for the warmer months and then Jerusalem artichokes in the cooler months. Brilliant. And there's nothing else, not nothing, but, you know, winter in the garden is such a sparse time for food. So the fact that we've got all these Jerusalem artichokes to eat during the three coldest months, that makes them another reason why I think they're a really good addition to the veggie patch. Mm. You don't have to peel them. You just scrub them. And scrubbing them is a bit of a prick because they got dirt on them. But, I mean, I hate peeling vegetables. So the fact that we can just roast them, like scrub them and harve them and roast them, I find really appealing. That may or may not speak to other people. I'm not sure. <laughs> Back to your list. What else have we got? Uh, they look very pretty. With their, They have yellow flowers, obviously, being a relation to the sunflower. So not only do they have these tubers in the ground, like the potato, but they've got this like beautiful display of flowers. You know, not a huge gain, but if we can kind of look pretty at the same time, I think that's quite appealing. Mm. You, they can also be grown in part shade. You know, the sun, sunny positions are always the prime spots. What I'm really interested in often is where can we grow something in a less than prime spot? Mm. Jerusalem artichokes, absolutely. And they grow in the shittiest of soils. There is no need to enrich your soil. I know Tessa's eyes just like her eyebrows just shot up to her hairline. She's like, <laughs> what? Elise is saying shitty soil can grow something edible? <laughs> they really, honestly, you could chuck them in the corner of the garden that you don't pay any attention to and you will still get a harvest. It won't be as good or as big of a harvest, but like these things grow like weeds, mm. which is just such a good thing. I mean, I'm going to put it down. This is another one of those easy wins in the garden for the beginner. I, You know how obsessed I am with watering systems? Like it's the yes. definition of my life. My artichokes do not have a watering system. There's no watering system. That just shows you how little attention you can give them and they will still thrive. I do. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, I get the hose on them, I don't know, once a month. That'd be about it. That and some rainwater and Bob's your uncle. Mm. You know, we've got the flavour, we've got the ease, and we've got the seasonal component with being harvested in winter. The one other benefit I'm going to list here is the health benefits. And we've never listed health benefits on this podcast. And I think, frankly, anything you could ever grow yourself is going to be incredibly nutritious. But there are some special benefits of the old Jerusalem artichokes that I would like to educate Ooh. people on. So... They are great for digestion, incredibly good for digestion, because what they are is they are a massive source of prebiotic fiber. So, you know, probiotics, everyone's heard of probiotics. Mm -hmm. Probiotics need to feed on prebiotics to grow. So if you're having, if you're taking probiotic supplements or you're drinking kombucha or you're doing all these other things to like help your good bacteria, if you're sending them into your gut with no food source, they actually can't thrive. So you have to get prebiotic fiber into your diet. And one of the best sources literally on earth is a Jerusalem artichoke. So well, there you go. that'll blow your mind. This will also blow your mind. If you're constipated, eat a Jerusalem artichoke and it will get things moving. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> because of all this fiber, they're very excellent at uh, speeding up transit, so to speak. But here is the warning I'm going to give on this also. Because of all this prebiotic fiber, if you're not used to it or you eat a shitload of them in one sitting and you're not used to eating them in one sitting. Yeah, pun intended there. <laughs> pun intended. Uh, they will make Watch you <laughs> stay close to a toilet. Also, they can make you fart, like really fart. Like you're not going to fart <laughs> until you've... <laughs> They do have a name, uh, a colloquial name of the farty choke. And oh, I like that. There's That's a clever. reason. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, look, they, that can be an advantage, like, you know, again, if you need some movement. But if you don't and you eat too many and you've never eaten them before, just watch out world. So maybe stick with them as the side dish and not the main dish the first time. Mm, and maybe you're not serving them up on a romantic night. Absolutely not. This is not <laughs> date night food, guys. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> Now, one more benefit of this is because it's got so much fiber in them, it makes them really low in glycemic index. So if people are trying to keep their blood sugars low and something like a potato can actually be a spike, cause a spike in blood sugar, Jerusalem artichokes won't because the fiber keeps it super, super low. So if you can't have potatoes, this actually might be a really good swap for you. Hmm. Food for thought. Amazing. 
literally. Fantastic. So between all those benefits, surely there's something in there that someone's uh, I've piqued their interest. Yeah, absolutely. Radio, what? let's get cracking on on how to cook, how to do it. How let's to grow them. learn how to do them. So they're just like a potato. We're growing them from a tuber, which is basically an old artichoke that sprouted little eyes exactly the same as the potato has. So if you've grown a potato before or you've listened to our potato episode, you're already halfway there. The only difference between the potato is that we don't have to worry about that certified seed aspect. Remember we I crapped on a lot mm-hmm. about that. There's actually not a lot of pests and diseases that worry the artichoke. So we don't have to worry about where we get them from. I'm just amazed at how hearty the old artichoke is so far. <laughs> It's such a win. Can grow it in a shady spot, don't have to worry too much about water, don't have to worry too much about soil quality, and you don't have to worry about getting certified seed potatoes. I know, exactly. I mean, a lot of people say they're like the food of the future because they're just like from a food security aspect, they're just so easy, so hardy, so nutritious, like they just tick all the boxes. So get yourself an artichoke. You can go to the organic food store and buy some artichokes and grow them that way. But probably the easiest way to get them is buy them from a seed company or an online gardening company or, you know, your nursery or something. They're going to sell them in a bag just like you bought your bag of potatoes. And they're going to have little little eyes on them. Now, if we're just getting them from the organic grocer, how many should we buy? Hmm. I planted, when I first started, I bought eight and I planted eight in a one by one metre patch. Okay. Not many, really. And that would have, I don't know, what would eight have cost me? Like five or ten ten bucks maybe? And the good thing about these, I'm jumping ahead here but I'm going to say it, is (laughs) (laughs) you actually, once you've bought them once, you never need to buy them again. It's like the raspberry or the strawberry situation. They just keep delivering year after year after year. So very cheap from that perspective. Mm. And I would say like a one by one meter bed that I've got, I haven't weighed it, but I would say it would have given us upwards of 10 kilos of artichoke. I am literally blown away by the Jerusalem artichoke and it just seems to be an absolute superhero. Well, I said to you, I said to Tess, I was like, I've just desperately want to do this episode and I can tell you're not keen, but I reckon you will be by the time I've told you all my favorite things about it. (laughs) (laughs) So we plant them in spring. So now is the time to get them in the ground. Mm -hmm. And sunny is better, but part shade is totally fine. You know how with our potatoes, we had the option of growing them in a potato sack? Mm. Can we do Jerusalem artichokes in the same way? Definitely. Absolutely. I've never heard anyone grow them in a potato sack per se, but I mean, you can grow them in pots or, you know, even that... Even the fabric grow bags that we've talked about a few times, you could absolutely grow them in that, no problem. So, yeah, I'm sure you could use a potato sack. The thing is, though, it is one of those crops that we're going to put in once and keep it in the same spot forever. Oh, okay. So the only thing with the potato sack is because it's got that flap on it, you're kind of wasting the flap because... Keep that for potatoes. Keep that for potatoes. But any kind of any kind of sack or fabric grow bag or pot, absolutely we can use that for our Jerusalem artichokes as well. And the Amazing. thing is, they they are so good at growing that they can actually get quite weedy. So for that reason, I want you to either grow them in a, a pot or a grow bag or a dedicated garden bed. I don't mm-hmm. want them just like free ranging or you thinking, oh, I'm just going to stick some in the end of my bed and grow my tomatoes in the other half or whatever. Mm. That's not going to fly. This is going to be a total domination situation. Okay. So for me, I've got my one by one meter raised bed. It was just like a cheapie that I bought from Audi and it only has Jerusalem artichokes in it and that is all it will ever grow. And that way I can also contain them so they don't start popping up everywhere else. So think carefully about where you plant them for this reason. People say that you can get them out of the ground and that they won't turn into a weed, but kind of like the potato discussion last week or the week before, good luck finding every single one. Because what happens is you miss an artichoke or you break off an artichoke and there's a tiny bit left in the bed and then that shoots the next year and then keeps giving Mm. you artichokes. So when you have a dedicated bed for it, that's perfect because what I did this year is I just harvested all my artichokes and then I'm sure I missed some. I didn't even intentionally miss some, but I know I have because there was just so many. And then every then come spring, they just sprout up, those ones I left. Mm. So it's like super low effort. But yes, you have to pick the spot. People say you don't. I can tell you do. <laughs> do not make that mistake. Obviously, with um, a pot, you're going to put less than eight by like eight, like I did in the 1.1. I would say you would put 
like one every 30 centimetres, 20 mm-hmm. to 30 centimetres. Yeah. Okay. The soil. You've got your growing vessel, whether it be the bed or the pot. We need some soil. Poor soil is fine. But like every other tuber discussion we've ever had, if the soil is loose and friable, you're going to get bigger Jerusalem artichokes. Mm-hmm. Really dense clay soil is not going to be good for getting the big tubers. So add some compost, add some straw, add some autumn leaves, add some manure, add whatever you want, just like loosen the soil up. That's what I care about more than like the nutrition per se. Okay. So we've got our soil. We're going to do them 30 centimetres, 15 to 30 centimetres apart, and we're going to plant them 10 to 15 centimetres deep. Mm -hmm. Quite similar to a potato. Yep. We're going to water them in the same way as a potato. We don't need to give them, you know, water all the time. Uh, They're pretty hardy even without water, but when it is very hot, what you'll see is the sunflower-like plants that are going to come up. So with the – sorry, I've jumped a bit. With the potatoes, you know how we have the shooty uppies that look a bit like basil? Mm -hmm. Here we have shooty uppies that are like – a meter and a half tall that look like a sunflower. So these are some How nice. I know these are some serious shooty uppies. These are like it's like bamboo shooty uppies. So <laughs> they'll have a nice little yellow flower on the top, and they'll have green leaves. If those leaves start to droop, you know they desperately need water. Mm. So give them a good drink. The other thing is, if you deprive them of too much water, what will happen is you'll just get smaller tubers. So for a bigger harvest and for some big artichokes you want to water them about once a week would be ideal but the thing's not gonna the whole project's not gonna fall over if you don't Mm -hmm. the other amazing benefit about them is because these sunflowers shoot up and grow really densely like bamboo there's actually no need to weed like you'll find whatever patch you've got them in there's no opportunity for a weed to take hold they're just monsters in the garden i like that benefit and the flowers that are on the top you can actually cut these and bring them inside like a bouquet. Mm. We might need a picture of these flowers. I think so. I will say they're not the prettiest sunflowers you've ever seen. Like I oh. don't <laughs> like. I mean, they're nice. Like they're yellow flower, but like you know, I'm not comparing them to the beauty of a sunflower. That's mm. for certain. But yeah, I will definitely find some photos. It is kind of hard to imagine really what I'm talking about because in one sense we've got these massive plants, and then in the other sense it's like the gold is under the ground. Mm. So. I've got no visual of this at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. I mean, you probably don't even know what the artichoke, other than my little photos on Instagram the other day, you wouldn't even know what the artichoke itself looks like, let alone the plant. I'm picturing some kind of ginger potato hybrid, really. That's actually the most accurate way I could probably describe it because ginger, <laughs> look at you go, ginger and turmeric also grow these like really tall like metre or high shooty uppies that look a bit like bamboo that's super dense and then mm. the tubers in the bottom are what you want. And then the same way that we do the Jerusalem artichokes in one bed and then grow them over and over again in that spot from what's left in the ground, we do the same with the ginger and turmeric. So there's definitely some similarities. And the thing with gardening is, I mean, like everything in life, not just with gardening, but once you've grown potatoes and you understand how that works, like this is very similar. So like it's not a huge learning curve to go from one to the next. And then once you've got these down pat, like ginger and turmeric are going to seem really easy for you. So it's like Mm. exponential growth in the gardening department. So in the ongoing care, we've discussed watering, but there's not, in terms of pests, they they sound like they're pretty durable. Yeah, they they are. There's like, I can't even, there's just nothing else. Like... (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so that's care. Shall we move on to harvesting? Let's, let's. Let me just talk you through the year of them. Maybe this will help. So come spring, once the weather warms up, our tubers will start to shoot wherever we've got them and we're going to get them in the ground. We're then just going to keep a water up roughly to them all through uh, spring and summer. Then at the end of summer, there's going to be the big shooty uppies and the beautiful flowers. We can harvest them and bring them inside. They actually say, I don't know if this is true or not, but if you actually cut off the flowers, the plant will send more energy to growing big tubers rather than growing flowers. So it'll actually give you a better harvest. So you might as well. I think it makes sense too. Like I don't do it unless I like if I want the flowers inside I bring them inside but I'm pretty lazy especially with my artichokes then towards the end of autumn once the weather starts cooling down again the flowers and these big bamboo stems are actually going to start dying and I mean like really dying they're going to look brown and terrible at this point, we're going to cut them down to be about 10 centimetres above ground level. So we're just going to slash this entire situation, all gone. Okay. Pretty easy because they're just brittle and brown and dead at this point anyway. Mm-hmm. Then what's underneath is actually all our artichokes ready to go. What's another fun fact about artichokes here is that they can sit 
in the garden bed or in the pot all winter with no problems. They can just hang out there. So you just dig them up when you want to eat them, which I love because if I had to manage digging up and storing 10 kilos of artichokes all at one time, that would be a bit of a pain. What we do is we just leave them there and they also don't store particularly well out of the garden bed. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, we're talking four months worth, like the last month of autumn and then the three months of winter. They can just hang out. When we want a little feed of artichokes, we go out to the garden, we get our gloves on and we do Elise's favourite task. We go on a treasure (laughs) hunt. Exactly the same way we do for potatoes. We just get the gloves on and start fossicking around in the dirt. Digging for gold. Digging for gold and finding these knobbly little treasures in our patch. You'll find they go down quite deep. So really like, you know, get your hands in there. I wouldn't use a garden fork or anything unless you really have to because I don't want you like stabbing into them. Mm. But you'll find they're just so many of them that it's it's pretty easy to just, yeah, get your hands in and get it done. So pull up whatever you want and then just leave the rest in the garden bed. I just am truly shocked by this vegetable. It's just the gift that keeps a gib on. It is. <laughs> it is. And like, again, you know, with that aspect of being able to keep the harvest in the ground, like you think of something like sprouting broccoli, like the second it's ready, you've got to harvest that thing and store it or eat it straight away. Mm. Like I hate that. Like I just, I want it there when I want it. I really like them from that perspective. It's, it's the easiest way to store them for you and it keeps them the freshest. So you just keep going all winter as you, as you see fit and then you want to get them, you want to have eaten them all before the weather starts warming up. And that is usually, I'd say like a week or two before spring starts because mm-hmm. once spring starts, like all our other bulbs and tubers, they will start sprouting again. So we want to eat them before they grow next year's. So then just in terms of the cycle, we're mm-hmm. back to back to spring now. Do we have to add more artichoke tubers into our same patch or is whatever's left over going to produce enough for the next year? Exactly right. What is left over will produce enough for the next year. There is no need God, to add any more. Just... <laughs> I know. It's just the gift that keeps on giving. It is the gift that keeps on giving. So you will naturally leave some in the patch. You just will. There's so many. And then, yeah, they're just going to sprout and do it all over again. If you leave too many, actually the problem is then that there isn't enough room for them all. So that can keep them small. So it's like this just shows you the kind of prolific nature of this tuber. Mm. So there's actually no conscious anything to do. You just harvest what you want and then when spring comes, you'll see the little shooty uppies come up again. The only thing I probably do do is just add a bit more mulch on top, whether that be you know, shitty straw from my chicken house or autumn leaves or whatever, just to like keep the volume up in the bed. But that's all I do. Wow. (laughs) If you get to the end of spring and sorry, sorry, the end of winter and you want to harvest all these because they're going to start sprouting otherwise, what you would do is you get out all that's left and you would store them in the fridge. And that way they... For, okay. for most intents and purposes, won't sprout because they still think it's cold and haven't realised it's spring outside. And if you run out of room in your fridge, just turn it all into soup and pop it in the freezer. Exactly, exactly. Like the roasting ones, that's that's actually exactly what I do, Tess. Like I roast them as I want them and then whatever was left, I did make into soup because pureed soup freezes so well and like roasted veggies, not so much. I will put in a caveat here. It doesn't apply to you and I, but if you're in a really hot climate, they sometimes don't overwinter that well and you may need to replant them every year. So that just sucks Mm. for you. (laughs) So that's all. That's, I feel like that's everything one needs to know. So the big question, is the juice worth the squeeze? This is where we look at the effort reward ratio of today's topic. The categories are superstar, high effort, high reward. Completing this will make you feel like an absolute rock star. Best on ground, low effort, high reward. Quick wins and fill-ins, low effort, low reward. And finally, the wooden spoon, high effort, but not much reward. I'm definitely sensing the excitement from you, Tess, that I have sold you on the artichokes. But let's discuss squeezy juice. Where's all this sitting for you? So many benefits. I love that it seems to be a prolific grower, that you really don't need to do that much to it. All of the health benefits we discussed. It sounds bloody wonderful. What I will say, and obviously this is the 
main consideration in the squeezy juice matrix, I've never actually eaten a Jerusalem artichoke. So obviously with any edible garden, that's the main thing. It's difficult for me to say whether I'm going to grow them or not if I haven't eaten them. <laughs> I thought you were going to say the biggest consideration on the squeezy juice matrix is if they're going to make me fart or not. <laughs> oh, I mean, that's... <laughs> <laughs> That's the secondary, secondary point. point. <laughs> Look, I agree. And uh, like, I love them now because I've learned how to cook them really well and I know what to do with them. But I think, you know, the first year I grew them, I kind of had them all and I was like, well, this is cool, but what do I do with them? Like, I do agree that mm. without having an, a, an excitement factor on the food scenario, it would be hard. But but I think the simple roasting is a pretty good, just, you know, such an easy way to enjoy them. But yeah, I mean, You'd be going into this blind as someone that hasn't eaten them before. And I think that when we talk about putting them in soups, you could hide things in a soup. If it's not your favourite flavour, then put other great flavours in there with it, like roasted pumpkins or other delicious things that will, I guess, turns out you don't love a Jerusalem artichoke, you can just blend it out. I feel like it may be early enough in spring test that you could still get to the health food store or the organic grocer or some kind of fancier establishment that may still have Jerusalem artichokes to purchase. Yeah, I reckon I'd be I might. so intrigued to see if mm. you actually like them. Yeah, like I don't think your mainstream supermarkets are going to stock them, but I think elsewhere we may be able to get you some. So there's a few um, nice grocers around me, so I will I'll check them out. Yeah, and then get back to, and I'll give you my little roasting instructions. Fabulous. You know what? Let's let's put the roasting instructions on Instagram. Yes, and then if anyone else is keen to go out and try an artichoke, we've still mm. got time to get them in the ground if we can't have acted quickly from now. Yeah, yeah, you've got a couple okay. of weeks, I reckon. And then it'll, yeah, then you got to wait till next year. But a couple of weeks, to, out to action, <laughs> Go everyone. Go and taste some Drew's Mata Chokes. <laughs> Look, and what's a little bit of gas between friends? <laughs> Rooting for You is hosted by Elise and Tess. You can find us on Instagram at Rooting for You Pod or email rootingforyou at elisealexandra.com.